Today, it's an honor to welcome to the conversation distinguished professor, scholar, historian, Sadeh Hazel Hussain. He's a distinguished professor from Oxford University. Today, we're gonna to be talking about his latest book, a biography on the life of Toussaint Louverture. It was a long conversation and due to its long duration, we've decided to uh, split it in two. So today you're going to watch part one of this interesting conversation. But before we get into the video, I just want to remind everyone that it's important to subscribe to this YouTube channel. And if you do, don't forget to click the notification bell so that way every time a video is posted, it'll go directly into your portable. So let's get started. Again, my name is Ardain Ismail. I am here with historian, uh, scholar, and also prolific writer, Sadeh Hazari Singh. We're gonna talk about Toussaint Louverture, uh, known as the precursor of the Haitian independence. To me today, it's so impressive, it's so important because I can trace my route back to Haiti. I was born in Haiti. I learned about the history of Haiti. But when I read his book and I realized how very little I knew <laughs> about the history of saint -Domain. So to begin with, Sadeh, welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much, Arden, for having me. It's a real pleasure. Okay, that's to officially get started. Uh, would you please tell the viewers of CSMS Magazine, all the viewers out there, who is Sadeh Hazari Singh? So, Sadeh Hazari Singh, uh, I was born on a little tropical island called Mauritius, which is in the Indian Ocean. And uh, it was one of these islands which was colonized almost by everybody. You know, the, the Portuguese found it, um, the Dutch settled it first, and the French took over, then after the French, the British. So basically, we've been around the houses. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> since 1968, we've finally become independent. So I was born there, went to school there. My parents, my father was... Um, an official in the newly independent government. Mm -hmm. My mother was from South Africa. Okay. So I, I already had a sort of um, international right. kind of <laughs> cosmopolitan background. Right. And since the 1980s, I've been studying and then teaching at the University of Oxford. And um, I do most of my research on French political history. And then my last book was about Toussaint Louverture. And you know, the first time I heard you speaking, it was in French. And so because French is a language that is not foreign to me, I was very impressed. And to see how you're so well versed in both languages, the langue de Voltaire and the language of Shakespeare. Yes, well, <laughs> that's one of the great advantages of being from Mauritius, because although the official language is English, um, everybody speaks French as well, and all the newspapers are in French. And um, uh, it, it's one of the things about French culture that even though um, uh, 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 people may have experienced it a long time ago, they still feel attached to it. And, and that was the case with me. Uh, I, I grew up, in fact, my, my interest in politics and in history was first stimulated okay. by learning about French history and it's French good. politics. Okay. So um, it's, uh, it's, an old, it's an old story in, in my case. Okay. Okay. And you know, CSMS Magazine is 17 years old. And at the very beginning, I had a young man named Paul Francois. He was from, um, uh, from Ile Maurice. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. We spent about five years. He was writing directly from Ile Maurice. And one day I asked him to write something in Russian Creole because he was a Creole activist. So he was such a beautiful, the only uh, piece I have in CSMS Magazine about the kind of Creole they speak uh, in, in Maurice. And also uh, he told me later that there were some similarities between 
the Creole that he speaks and the one they speak in the Seychelles. He's not sure if. Uh, <laughs> yes, and even even with Haitian Creole, um, one of my one of my good friends in Mauritius who teaches at the university is actually a. a a specialist in the history of languages, okay. um, linguistics. Okay. And he says that actually Mauritian and Haitian Creole have, have some interesting similarities. Uh -huh. And, and it, it's, 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 it's surprising in a way because the people, the people who ended up in Haiti and the people who ended up in Mauritius didn't come necessarily right. from the same part. Exactly, exactly. But nonetheless, I suppose Creoles have a fundamental common root anyway. I think so. I think so. Uh, because I remember when we began to speak in Creole, I, at some point I didn't realize that he was really, I thought that he was Haitian. <laughs> you know. Exactly. But exactly. so we're getting into Toussaint. Very impressive, impressive book. The latest biography on a man that everyone considers as arguably the most powerful black man of the 18th century. But also, uh, from the get go in the book, I just want to ask you this question. You said that to Saint thrive in the collective mind of the 19th century. But you know, to Saint died very early on, and he died, didn't even know if the country of the land that he fought for so fiercely uh, was going to be named uh, Haiti. So could you please elaborate a bit further, just for the purpose of education, Professor Sinderic? Yes, well, um, he, when he was captured and um, ended up in this terrible prison um, in France, um, where he spent the last, the last year of his life, um, the, the war of national liberation had already started in, in Saint-Domingue. And, and the war had started because the French had sent, Napoleon had sent a very large invading army, basically not only to overthrow the, the revolutionary uh, regime which Toussaint uh, had created, but also effectively to restore slavery. Mm. And, and indeed the French did restore slavery in other parts of the Caribbean that were under their control. So this was a war which was fought to the death. And although Toussaint was captured, his, his lieutenants, most notably Dessalines, mm. led the war to, to its successful conclusion. And, um, and this is really the, the wonderful, um, in a sense, it's, it's almost, I was about to call it the, the epilogue, but actually it's a whole chapter in itself. Mm -hmm. Once the Haitian War of Liberation has ended, Haiti becomes this shining example for all the men and women across the Atlantic world who are fighting against slavery, who are fighting for freedom, who are fighting for social justice, who are fighting for racial justice. And one of the most striking things that I discovered was how long and rich this tradition of identification with uh -huh. Haiti was. Haiti was like the, the cause célèbre for progressive men and women all over the Atlantic world uh, in the 19th century, but also for, you know, large parts of the 20th as well. So it's a really, um, it's a story that doesn't end in the early 19th century. It continues all the way through to, uh, to our own time. There's uh, one thing I really learned after reading your compelling, impeccable biography is uh, the war against the British in saint -Domain. And I don't think that many generations of young Haitians, I don't think they have a vague idea of how skillful the revolutionaries in Haiti were in fighting the British. Uh, although we knew that the British occupied the Western portion of the island and they set up some form of a city government in the, city, in the town of Mont saint Nicolas. Uh, we also know, I know personally that uh, in Mel Saint Nicola was the last bastion of the British forces. It was the town, uh, according to Madieu, uh, where General Thomas Mitman um, 
I believe uh, we drew, uh, agree with to saying, we may clarify that, uh, to withdraw his forces from the island. But I knew nothing. Basically, I was pretty much ignorant regarding uh, not only were the British, how deep they were in occupying towns and villages in Saint-Domingue, but also how skillful and powerful the Haitian revolutionary and fighting them off. So could you please uh, uh, tell us how did the British had managed to, to, to get a foothold in Saint-Domingue? Yes, thank you. It's a really important and uh, an understudied part of the story. And indeed, it's a part of the story that even many British people don't know, and, and it's not even taught in, in British history, and, and I think it should. But it, it, it happens really um, first because in 1793, um, the French authorities, who are still in charge of Saint-Domingue at that time, um, are forced by the revolutionaries to abolish slavery. They don't do it of their own free will. Right. Um, in fact, they're very reluctant to do it, um, but they are forced to do it. And, and, and it's important to tell the story that way. This isn't a great act of emancipation by the enlightened French. It's, it's a decision that the local French commanders take because there's been a, uh, an insurrection by the enslaved men and women in 1791. And they basically say to the French, if you still want to retain control of this island, um, you have to emancipate us. And the French are reluctant initially, but by the middle of 1793, they realize that their control of the colony depends on uh, 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 buying at least uh, the support um, of uh, a majority of the black men and women on the island. So they abolish slavery. Now, once they do that, of course, the white settlers who are on the colony right. um, turn away from the French right. and um, look around for anyone who's willing to take up the fight um, uh, uh, against the, 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 the enslaved people who have revolted. Right. And they turn naturally to the British. So it's the, it's the local white settlers who invite the British basically to come and invade the island. And, and the British do it for, for obvious um, political and strategic reasons. They uh -huh. do it because they had always um, looked very enviously at Saint-Domingue. Saint-Domingue was known as the Pearl of the Antilles. It was the wealthiest colony in the Caribbean. In fact, it was the wealthiest colony in the world, right? the most productive, the most, um, the most profitable, uh, and the British were only had Jamaica, which was okay by 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 colonial standards, but it was nothing like um, as rich and as profitable as uh, as Saint Domingue. So the British see this as a great opportunity, um, both to um, you know fight the French Revolution and and the idea of abolishing slavery, but also to extend their influence. So Pitt basically, once he decides to go in, goes all in and sends in 20,000 men oh. and spends um, several million pounds, 10 million pounds, I think, um, on the whole expedition, which lasts five years. And which, um, and, and, and Toussaint and, and his men fight them in a very intelligent way because they don't go all out to try and defeat them militarily. Um, they, they fight them on the ground initially um, in, in a number of battles until around 1796. And then Toussaint has this brilliant idea, which is basically the same strategy which, which, which is later used against the French, which is to pin down the enemy uh -huh. in one or two locations so that the British end up being pinned down in Mont Saint-Nicolas in the north. Um, in Port Républicain, you know, Port-au-Prince today, um, uh, uh, the capital city um, in, um, in the West, and in one or two locations in the South. And, and they're surrounded by, um, by Toussaint's men. And of course, they can, be, um, they can receive provisions by sea, so they're able to sustain the, um, the, the siege for quite some time. But actually, over time, they become demoralized um, and uh, a large number of British troops die of yellow fever. Um, 
In fact, a majority of the troops are killed off, not, not by combat, but by disease. And Toussaint knew that that would happen. So he just waits patiently until the British are completely demoralized and decimated. And then in 1798, he reaches out to um, uh, General Maitland, who's sent over to negotiate uh, an honorable withdrawal. And he signs uh, this, this withdrawal agreement. But make no mistake, uh, even though it was a, um, a negotiated withdrawal, the British didn't withdraw out of um, you know, the kindness of their heart. They withdrew because they were facing inevitable defeat. That's interesting. I like uh, the way you stress that. On page 82, uh, you probably answered part of that question, because on page 82, you mentioned Tucson's frustration, uh, a frustration that he conveyed to the governor at that time, I think Governor Navo, uh, expressing how his troops, lack of basically, you know, basic necessity, they were poorly fed, poorly dressed, and some of them, as you say, and I quote, they were naked like earthworms. Now, immediately after I read this passage, I know it must have been uh, blatant racism or maybe Tucson's victory over the British forces will receive some sort of a half-hearted or maybe a lukewarm uh, reception uh, because of the fact that they would probably would not want to see uh, black soldiers uh, overrun British forces in an island. As you just said, they were primarily, they invited them to come and hopefully uh, uh, help them restore order and slavery basically on the island. Yes, there was there was a lot of racism um, against um, against the um, the African born soldiers and um, and in fact um, this racism also was present among among the French. You know the French early on. Um, even the people who admired Toussaint uh, on the French side thought that the um, African-born people were not um, good enough to be uh, 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 strong soldiers. Um, uh, they thought that um, they weren't disciplined enough to, um, to be able to um, wage war with the same um, effectiveness as, uh, as European soldiers. And I think this is one of the many extraordinary achievements of Toussaint Louverture, that he takes these um, very um, badly equipped um, people who, who mostly were, well, almost all of them were actually former slaves. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, he builds an army, um, mm -hmm. a formidable army. Mm -hmm. You know, he begins very modestly with just a few thousand men. You know, in, by 1794, 1795, he just has a few thousand men. By 1797, the, the Saint-Domingue army is 20,000 strong, and it's a formidable army, and it's defeated um, the Spaniards. You know, by 1795, the Spaniards have been kicked out of Saint-Domingue. And by, by 1797, the, they're on their way to defeating the, the, the British as well. And what is very um, impressive is that this is done by an army that is trained by Toussaint. And, and the training is, a, is one which um, uses both what, what you might call traditional European military techniques, um, which Toussaint learns from uh, uh, various uh, French military officers, but also um, African military techniques, because a lot of these soldiers um, who were in Toussaint's army were born in Africa and had been involved in um, <clears throat> military campaigns when they were young men um, in, in Western Africa. And, and Toussaint's genius is really his capacity to use both what you might call traditional uh, European military techniques, um, as well as um, these um, uh, 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 African methods, which we would call today perhaps guer guerrilla warfare. Indeed, the word guerrilla we, we we have come to use in our in 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 the English language. It comes from a little bit later, 
when um, uh, the Spaniards resisted Napoleon. But when you look at what uh, Toussaint's fighters are doing in the 1790s, they're doing guerrilla warfare already. <laughs> because they knew the terrain, they can hide. And in fact, uh, it was reported that some of the French soldiers realized in the mountains, the Negroes from the mountains, they were speaking a language that sounded like French, but they had, they had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then they came back from here and then, and then disappeared just to reappear, you know, a few meters down the road. <laughs> They didn't know. They didn't know what hit them, basically. Um, and of course, this uh, this technique is the one also that is used very successfully in the War of Independence um, by Dessalines and his men. So, so, so Toussaint. I think if you think about him as a military, um, uh, mm -hmm. what he does is in the 1790s he wages this very brilliant series of campaigns against the imperial powers that are trying to um, control Saint-Domingue. But he also lays the ground um, for the successful military campaign that is fought um, by his lieutenants. His lieutenants. And now let me ask you a question. This is going to lead us to the second part of this conversation. Um, you mentioned that Toussaint's military high command was of mixed races. He had he had black officers, uh, mulattoes, and, and ultimately white officers, which seems to reflect when he won ultimately became the uh, governor of the island. He created a government that looks like the you know the population of Sandwich. In other words, I interpret it as an attempt to create an inclusive society which to me was far seeing, considering the fact that many of his high officers, you know, his generals didn't seem to understand Toussaint's diplomacy. My question, Professor Sunder, don't you think that Toussaint blundered on the strategy of independence by relying too heavily on French uh, uh, planters and French, you know, rich farmers, those who own slave and, you know, don't you think that it was a strategy that he did not fully explain it to his generals? And then the way we can say that it was a strategic mistake on his part. You know? I think it's, a, it's an absolutely fair question. And, and I know it's a question that people still debate very um, passionately in Haiti and, and elsewhere. You know, in a sense, there's two camps in Haiti still. There's the supporters of Papa Toussaint mm. and the supporters of Papa Dessalines. Uh -huh. And Dessalines, of course, was the man who thought, I mean, he didn't think this all the time, but we have evidence that by probably by around 1800, 1801, Dessalines thought that you know, the French presence was, and indeed the white European presence was, was, was a hindrance uh, and that if, if Saint-Domingue wanted to have freedom and self-determination, that it should eliminate the, the colonial settlers. Toussaint didn't think that. And, and let me try and offer a, a, a defense of that. Okay, view. okay. I want to hear your defense on that. <laughs> so the defense goes something like this. Um, it's tactical, first of all. Um, I, I don't think Toussaint was opposed in principle to independence but he thought that in the context of the 1790s, where after all, this was the only country in the world, right, literally, where racial equality was being practiced, that it was not very wise to create um, uh, 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 an independent state, which would be immediately um, opposed by all the existing colonial and imperial powers, right? Um, an independent Haiti, um, Toussaint believed would have a um, you know a, a bullseye um, on its back um, immediately, and therefore he thought it was more sensible to you know one of his uh, favorite expressions was doucement aller loin, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. and so he thought you know uh, which one could translate as you know um, 
let time takes it, take its course. He thought the most sensible thing to do in the short and medium term was to um, build a, a sort of self-determining um, political community, um, drawing on the um, relative strength of all the different uh, um, uh, parts of the population on the island, and, um, and doing it under the protection of the French, because um, that was the main thing. He believed that as long as the French continued to remain true to revolutionary principles, they would want to continue to support um, the revolution in Saint-Domingue. Now, it didn't work out like that, but I think it didn't work out like that, not because Toussaint had miscalculated, but because Napoleon miscalculated. Really? Napoleon, Napoleon admitted uh, as much um, when he ended up a prisoner in, in, in St. Helena mm. after 1815. You know, we have numerous uh, accounts mm. which have him say, I made a terrible mistake. I should have uh, made a compromise with Toussaint Louverture. Mm. And both the interests of France and the interests of saint domingue yeah. would have been um, reflected. So I think Toussaint had... Um, a good idea, which was uh, one which in the shorter run would have protected Saint-Domingue. Because let's not forget, and this is also an unfortunate part of the story, oh. when Haiti does become independent, all the imperial powers turn against her. Yeah, that's what and, I was going to say. And there is then this shameful act which takes place after 1825, whereby as a condition of uh, diplomatic recognition, the French imposed this uh, indemnity of 150 million um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 francs, mm -hmm. which um, basically cripples the Haitian economy for the, for the whole of the 19th century. You see, this is what Toussaint wanted to avoid. He wanted to uh, uh, do things in such a way as not to antagonize um, uh, the main imperial powers. Now, it didn't work out that way, of course, but I think the idea was not, not a bad one. Let me ask you something. Uh, don't you think that strategy begins to deteriorate or disintegrate after the battle of La Creta Piero? Because many historians say at that point on to symbolize he could not fight uh, the French invasion and win without the support of his general. Um, by then, his brother Paul Louverture in Santo Domingo had already uh, uh, surrendered to the French forces. And his biggest blow was the Night Brigade in Port de Paix with a brilliant general, Jacques Morpa. As a matter of fact, I was trying to do some research on Morpa because it seemed to me a very multi faced kind of character. Uh, people, very few historians really talk about him. And I was trying to write a historical fiction on him. And <laughs> yeah, because his defeat really uh, was a major blow in certain strategy. And don't you think? I think that's right. Um, and by the way, on Moopa, um, I found a very wonderful set of documents in yeah. the um, regional de uh, departmental archives in Bordeaux. Um, where they have, they have a collection of letters, including the letters that Maurepas wrote to Toussaint Louverture. So you can, um, and, and they're available online. So if you go to the Archive Départementale de la Gironde and uh, follow, follow the links, um, you, you, you'll be able to find them. And, and if you can't find them, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll dig them up for you. But basically, I, I think that's right, that... Uh, obviously, once the French come to invade and re-enslave Saint-Domingue, Toussaint's strategy changes. But here too, I think he followed, you know, a very clear strategy, which is to um, sign a truce with them, right? Which is what he does mm -hmm. uh, around the middle of 1802. And, and the truce wasn't um, an acknowledgement of defeat. Um, it was simply, um, uh, he was playing for time again, because he knew that in the short run, he didn't have enough uh, manpower to defeat the French. So it, it was basically applying the, the strategy that had worked with the British again, which is to sit back, 
wait for disease to take its toll. And once that would happen, um, the, the, the French would be in a, a better position to be defeated. So um, that, that is in effect what uh, uh, the strategy that was uh, implemented by Dessalines and by, by Pétion. Unfortunately, Toussaint was no longer there um, to, to witness it because th this is one major mistake that he that he did commit. He allowed himself to be to be captured, and 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 perhaps there, um, you know, he was too too trusting of the French. He thought that the French military were men of honor, and and that, and that if they gave their word, that they would be true to it. But of course, we know that they were completely dishonorable in the way that they fought this war. And, and from the minute they arrived, in fact, they, they massacred people who surrendered, they, they committed atrocities. Um, you know, all the atrocities that took place in the Haitian War of um, uh, Independence uh, were always initiated by the French. Um, so... Really? So last question, and then we, we're probably gonna stop and then we'll start again, because the conversation is so interesting. Uh, yeah. Last question, maybe we went to, well, don't you think that Toussaint's arrest could have been averted? At least it would have been extremely difficult for the French forces to capture Toussaint. Had he continued to enjoy the support of his generals? Yes, I think that's right. And, and this goes back to something you were saying earlier, perhaps one of the other um, slight blunders that Toussaint makes towards the end of his career is that he doesn't really, um, you know, he doesn't consult um, his lieutenants um, enough. He doesn't tell them what his plan is. Um, but I think there's good reason for that. And that's because he didn't want anyone to suspect what his, what his real strategy was. Because he knew that people like Christophe and Dessalines I mean, certainly by the time that the French arrive, Dessalines is talking to the French. You know, Christophe is, Christophe, we have evidence now that shows that even before the French invasion, Christophe was building connections with, with the French. Um, so he, 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 Toussaint couldn't, couldn't trust any of his lieutenants to be 100% loyal to him. And that I think is, is perhaps the, the tragedy for Toussaint, that by the time the French arrive, because the French are not stupid. Uh, I mean, they, are, they were terribly stupid in the sense that they, they arrived in Saint-Domingue thinking that they would win easily. And, and that was a terrible mistake on their part. But when it comes to being um, cynical and Machiavellian, they, they realize that one thing that they can do is play off one, one Saint-Domingue general against another. So particularly- CLR Jim also clearly said, because with the big, one of the biggest differences between Toussaint and Desai, because Desai yes. doesn't believe in French lies. <laughs> so he had bluntly, brutally, but even Madhu said, uh, uh, this was one of the reasons why Desai succeeded where Toussaint seems to have failed. But that's true. But, but initially, Dessalines cooperates with the French. I never knew that. I really didn't know that. In order to eliminate Toussaint. And, and this, is very, this is very delicate, of course, because when you say that, a lot of people, including a lot that. of people in Haiti today, will be very upset. But, you know, I sat in the French National Archives and, and had letters in my hands um, signed by French generals who were talking about the conversations that they were having with Dessalines in the run up to Toussaint's arrest. So there's no doubt at all that, you know, it's not that Dessalines um, or helped organize the, the capture of Toussaint, but the French knew that Dessalines would look the other way um, when it happened. So, um, and that's, you know, <clears throat> there's the old expression with, uh, with colonial powers, divide and rule. And, 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 and that's what the French tried to do mm -hmm. um, with, with the leadership of Saint-Domingue. Mm -hmm. and, and who knows, it might have succeeded um, for a little longer uh, if the French hadn't been incredibly stupid also in announcing that their intention was to restore slavery, right? <laughs> which is what they did in Guadeloupe initially. <laughs>
Right. Once that news um, breaks in, in, in Saint-Domingue, which it does uh, around the middle of 1802, the French position has become completely um, untenable. And indeed, the position of anyone trying to cooperate with the French from, from a kind of Haitian point of view becomes untenable as well. Nobody can support the French if the, if the purpose of the French is to restore slavery. 